Good morning, so good to be with you. Aren't you thrilled with the people you're sitting with right now? Don't you love them? That was your chance to make up if you fought on the way to church. We believe in being together. There's something dynamic, there's something special that the Holy Spirit does when we gather together. This is commanded by Jesus on this rock, I will build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Don't forsake the assembly of the brethren as some I have become accustomed to. This matters, the fact that we get together. I know you could watch it online, but you didn't. You came here and it really matters. If you're a guest or visitor here, I'm really thankful that you're here. And we believe that God is doing something in your life. And here you are at church, and we want to partner with you and help you in that relationship. You may have noticed that over the last number of months, maybe a couple years, we've been bringing Lavinia over at the 1030 service to join with us as we've been preparing to be completely integrated together. We believe that God is magnified in our diversity and in our unity. So we, we've been making this plan. We feel like we've been led by the Lord to have our Lavinia campus, our Lavinia church, join us. And that's going to begin to happen this summer uh, for every single weekend, uh, we will be together, and Lavinia will be with us. Isn't that exciting? So we're thrilled for that. Opportunity for you, and also in the, in the uh, coming weeks, you'll be hearing, if you're bilingual, I, I want to have you stand up, but if you're, I'm not going to, but if you're bilingual, you need to know that the Spirit of God is speaking to you right now through my voice. That we're going to need you to help us with translation and with all the many things that will go into making that integration a huge success. We're continuing today in our series in Esther. As uh, we're in about the third week of our series in Esther. And the entire point of this message today, and I will say it over and over again through the course of this message, is that when God seems hidden, he is up to something. When God seems hidden in your life, he is up to something. This uh, is true if you have any boys in your life around, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. When they have friends over, it's going to be loud. They're going to make all kind of boy noises. You know what I'm talking about right now? And as long as it's noisy and it's loud, it's, it's, it's all good. And they're probably breaking something, and you expect that. But as soon as it gets quiet, uh-huh, somebody said, uh-oh. That's when you holler their name, because you know if it gets quiet, they're up to something. This illustration might not be great, but I'm just saying, whenever, <laughs> there are times in your life when you don't really know. You know God is doing something, but you don't know exactly what the result is going to be. There may be times in your life where you're praying and you feel like your prayers aren't answered, your prayers aren't being answered, your prayers aren't even being heard. There's a time where it's just, it feels dark, your emotions could be off, you're just not really connected with God and and you're just not sure. I want to encourage you today that even when he seems like he is hidden from view, he is working his redemptive plan in your life. Sometimes he's hidden because the, the voices and the noises in our life are so loud. Our soul is crowded with the voices of this world. We can be so busy. We can be led totally by our flesh. And and in that way, when we're operating and functioning that way, it it limits our ability to hear the voice of God. God is speaking, but there's been times in my life when I didn't want to hear it. So I can can not listen to to his voice. Next weekend, we're going to talk about the difference between being led by the Holy Spirit Walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh, well, things that we learned from Esther. But there's a lot of reasons why you might not be able to hear him, but even when he seems hidden, he's still at work in your life. And this is what's so interesting about the book of Esther. The book of Esther is maybe one of only two books in the Bible where the name of God is not mentioned. And it's not an overtly religious book or a Christian story. There's not proverbial wisdom. It's not like... Uh, You know, the five love languages according to Xerxes, that ain't happening. It's not going to teach you how to have a successful marriage or family. There's not a a lot of Proverbs in it, and yet, and God is not mentioned. And yet from this story, inspired by the Holy Spirit in the Word of God, God teaches us that even when there's not overt, miraculous signs and wonders that he's there, because there's no miracles in this entire story, yet there is a consistent 
uh, act of God behind the scenes doing what only he can do. Not overt miracles, but there are these coincidences that are God being providential and moving and working and, and really miracles behind the scenes. So we have a lot to cover today. And uh, this story gets uh, uh, really, uh, really interesting. And so we want to see what we can understand from his word uh, together today. I want to begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you that you're with us. Thank you that you said that any time we gather in your name, that you are here. So, Holy Spirit, we're open. We're receptive. Lord, these folks have made the effort to come to church today. And so, God, uh, what we want to do is minister to you. So we open our minds, we open our hearts to what you would say to us. And the very thing that you want to say to us by the power of your Holy Spirit and your word, Lord, we're going to receive that and we're going to act on that. So come and be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Esther chapter 2, 21. Um, one day as Mordecai was on duty in the king's gate, dot, 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 too long of a story to read. Let me just tell you what happened. Mordecai is a cousin to Esther. Esther has been, uh, she has the favor of God on her life. She becomes the queen. We covered that last week. Then apparently she gives a job to Mordecai. Mordecai is her cousin, 50 years her senior. She is an orphan Jew in a foreign land in Susa. King Xerxes had given the command, his grandfather had given the decree and command that all of the Israelites could return to Jerusalem but some had not returned. So Mordecai and Esther had not returned. Mordecai had a, had a job. We don't know exactly what it was, but it was in the king's area and, and near the gate. And, and it was given to him uh, because Esther was the queen and she was able to do that. He was out at the gate one day and he heard some disgruntled employees. I don't know if you've ever worked with any disgruntled employees. Is there such a thing as disgruntled employees? I work at a church. We're all angels here. It's all perfect and wonderful. And he hears this plan and this plot that they're going to kill King Xerxes. They're going to assassinate the king. So he tells Esther, Esther tells the king, and then the king uh, knows that from Esther that Mordecai had saved his life. They didn't do anything for Mordecai. They just wrote it down in a book of history. Sometimes you can do the right thing and you feel like, I'm not rewarded. I mean, I'm living, I'm doing right, and it just doesn't seem like I'm lifted up or I'm given the opportunity that I should be given. But just wait. Justice delayed is not justice denied. Well, then Haman, who is uh, the villain and buffoon in this story, and it's a wonderful part of the story we're going to cover today, Haman was, for what reason we do not know, elevated to a place of authority. He had great authority, and what he really wanted was every person. He was one of these people that when they were promoted, they, they got the ring, and they wanted everybody to kiss the ring. They wanted, he wanted everybody to tremble. He's the worst kind of leader you would ever want that whenever he walks around, he wants everybody to bow down. And he loves the fact that everybody's going to bow down except that Mordecai does not. Esther chapter 3, when Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow down or show him respect, he was filled with rage as prideful men are. He had learned of Mordecai's nationality. So he decided it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the entire empire of Xerxes. So there is a Hatfield and McCoy kind of relationship here between Mordecai and Haman. Because Haman was of the Amalekites. You remember the Israelites, when they were going to do battle against the Amalekites, whenever Moses lifted his hands, they won the battle. Whenever his hands went down, they lost the battle. And then Samuel, the prophet, actually took the king of the Amalekites in front of Saul and sliced him into many pieces about a thousand years before this happened. Mordecai being a Jew and Haman being of the Amalekites, they would have known this rich history, and that's why they hated one another. That's why, say, like the Hatfields and McCoys, and Mordecai would not bow down to Haman. There was a family issue here. There was also the fact that he was a Jew, and he would not bow down to people much like Daniel or, or the others in Scripture. They would bow down to God, but they wouldn't bow down to any man. And don't you know that Mordecai was the type of man that was only, no matter a hundred people could bow down, but you let one not bow down, and he was enraged by this man. So he went to the king, Haman did. He said, I want you to give me the money and the resources necessary. I'm going to annihilate not only Mordecai, but all of his people throughout all of the land of Persia. This is, where, this is the whole point, really, of the story, is that God is going to use an orphan Jewish girl in a foreign land 
that he's going to promote by his sovereignty and his providence and put her at the right place at the right time to deliver all of the people of Israel because he's God and he can do that sort of stuff. Haman goes out and gets this decree going. Mordecai and all of the Jews in all of the land are, are going to uh, pray. They're, not, they're going to fast and they're, they're really afraid because they're all going to be annihilated. Esther chapter 4, the, the story goes on. Mordecai then sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. Do you feel the pressure he's putting on her now? If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Pause right there for a second. What he's saying is even if you don't go along with the plan that God has for your life, God is still going to have his way in the world. You don't have to go along with the plan of God. God is, I'm going to tell you this something you already know. The kingdom of God is not dependent upon Rob King following God. If Rob doesn't follow God, God's going to be okay. He, he wants me to, and he's made a way for me to, and his son died for me to, but if I don't, he's still going to have his redemptive plan throughout all of history. He's invited you to join him, but if you don't join him, he's still going to redeem the world. And it's interesting to me that Mordecai says this, you, you have been called and here it is and here's an opportunity for you, but even if you don't, God will find a way to save his people because he's God and he's, and he's sovereign. Now, if you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. He's saying, look, you need to act. And she was scared. She hadn't been before the king for 30 days and anybody who comes in before the king uninvited dies. And then he says this. Now, this is the quintessential kind of part of the, the story that we, we all know and love. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this? Now, we all know the story, so we know for a fact that she was made king. She was made queen. She was made queen by God, and it was exactly for this time. But I want to break down, uh, just before we get to the rest of the story, I want to break down this well-known passage and, and just take a look at it. It begins with, who knows if perhaps? <laughs> Isn't that great? Does that feel like your life with God or not? I mean, I know we're taught right now we should come in and we should know and you should declare and you should da-da-da-da-da-da-da, but I live in a who knows if perhaps kind of way most of the time with God. How many of you, by a show of hands, have a situation in your life right now, you are trusting God, but you have no idea how it's going to work out? Anybody? Okay, most all of us, the honest ones. <laughs> Who knows if perhaps? I'm saying that's actually the way we live with God. That is our relationship with God, and it is a great statement of faith. Who knows if perhaps? David said, I, I, I didn't know. I mean, when my son was alive and I prayed, and who knows if perhaps God might do something. Let me tell you something. You don't control God. I'm going to say it again. You do not control God. And some people act like faith is this thing where we have to never have a single doubt and always just totally declare like we know exactly what he's going to do and we're going to tell God. Have you ever told God what to do? How'd that work out? You can have total faith in him and not know what he's going to do. And he's okay with that. Do you know God is not looking down from heaven saying, wait, you have perfect faith. And the moment you have a Monday morning doubt, oh, I'm not going to do what I told you I was going to do. You don't have perfect faith. Some people live that way. God is God in heaven. See, we struggle with the fact, we struggle with our humanity and his divinity. He knows you're human. And he knows your frame. You know, he doesn't expect you to be only some kind of divine being. Jesus let go of his rights as the son of God and in essence became fully human, yet fully God, yet didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. So he, he set aside all of his divinity and he slept like we sleep. Jesus did. And he woke up tired and he was hungry and he felt emotion. And there were times where he woke up and his neck was just, just not quite right. Why? Because we have a high priest now who is acquainted with our weaknesses. He's fully human and fully God. He knows what it's like to be human. But we struggle with this. Who knows if perhaps. 
when I was growing up, I, I went to Catholic uh, school and, and, um, and uh, Catholic church and went through catechism and first communion and made a banner. And, and then my folks started, uh, when I was about 10 years old, they started going to this Pentecostal church. <laughs> if you brought up Catholic and you go to a Pentecostal church, that's called spiritual whiplash. <laughs> You're like, whoa, whoa, what mean of this? Are they drunk as we suppose? I mean, it was a wild, it was a wild show, and we'd have this worship, and it'd just go on and on and on and on, this worship, you know. Then there'd be a moment of just quiet. You know, somebody would yell out in another language, a heavenly language. I had no idea what they were saying. Should have bought a Honda. I mean, they were just out there saying this stuff. Shandai, Shandai, Hikimo, should have bought a Honda. I didn't know what they were saying. Then there'd be another moment of silence, and there'd be somebody speak out an interpretation of what this person just said. I was not in the Catholic Church anymore. <laughs> Do you know most of the time, whatever, everything that they said, that, that interpretation, was right in line with Scripture? It was comforting, and it was an exhortation, and it was good, and it was helpful, and it was encouraging? But I could tell also that the person who was given the interpretation struggled with the fact that something so obviously spiritual was happening through a human vessel. You know how I knew that they struggled with it? Because usually they'd take on a different voice than they normally had. Why did it get so quiet? Because they would holler out, you know, and they would say what the Lord, but they would say things, thus saith the Lord from the prophet Isaiah. And you're like, Gary, what are you talking about? We know you. Would have been just as meaningful if he just said, hey, I, I feel like the Lord's saying that you should just keep serving him and, you know, give all your sin over to him. There was always an encouraging word. But we struggle. Why am I saying that? I'm saying this because we struggle. You think that there is some spiritual plateau that you need to reach in order to walk in the Spirit of God, to be led by the Spirit of God, and there's not. God knows who you are. If you pray in the King James, he's going to say, Gary, stop doing that. Why are you, I mean, he won't call you Gary if your name's not Gary, I'm just saying. <laughs> you, you have some idea that some spirit, there's some spiritual loftiness out there because you struggle with your humanity and his divinity, but your humanity doesn't limit his divinity in your life. You submit and you live your life according to him. The drives that you have have been given by God. Your appetite is not a, a sin and, and your sexual desire is not a sin. Now, all of that can go into sin, but it's given by God and he knows that you have that. There's humanity and there's divinity, and so in our relationship with him, there, there isn't a, a, a perfect kind of faith. What there is usually is a, is a if, perhaps, uh, who knows, if, perhaps. Huh? I've got some situations in my life, I know you do too, where you just don't know exactly how it's going to work out, but I know that God's intentions are good, and I know that he is good. And I know that he works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I can say, Lord, I don't know what you're going to do, but I know it's going to be good. Yeah. You can say, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to go through. <laughs> But I know in the end it's going to be good because you are good. And, Lord, you know that I don't know what you're doing. But you also know that I completely trust you in what you're doing in my life. I trust you. This is what he wants. This is what faith is. Faith is not saying everything as if you're telling God everything that you want him to do. That's not faith. Or saying, this, I know exactly how this is going to work out. And this is how it's going to work out. And like God is determined on what you've just said. That's not how it works. He is God in heaven and he does what he wants. Your job is to trust in him no matter what. Sometimes you know very clearly he's given you a word, he's spoken a word to you, and you hang on to that word and you walk in that faith. And a lot of times you say, who knows if perhaps. You say, what's he doing in this situation? Man, it's good. That means I have no idea, but it's going to be good. See, who knows if perhaps is one way of saying God is up to something even if I don't know the details. I want to encourage you today to have that kind of faith in the areas of your life that are, you're not quite sure. I haven't, I don't know. You cannot know and still know that God is good and faithful. You cannot know and still know that God is faithful and true and he's good and that kind of faith pleases him. Who knows if perhaps? Who knows if perhaps? And then he goes on to say, you were made queen. Now we know the story. 
that she was made queen. Who knows if perhaps. Yes, she actually was by the sovereignty of God given that favor and made queen. You were made. This is the point I want to make to you right now. It's good for us just to remind ourselves, you were made. You are not an accident. You are not in the wrong time at the wrong place. You are exactly who God intended you to be. You are in the body that he intended you to be in. You are in the family he intended you to be in. Now you know who to blame for that. You're in the city that he intended you to be in. You are made. And you can tell the the way that something is made, you can tell by the design what the intention is. You have been designed by Almighty God. And you can tell just by the way that you've been made the intentions that God has for you. You can tell by the design of a car what it is intended for. If you have a Volvo, you know that was not intended for speed. That is a box on wheels. That's intended for safety. I can run over things and not know it. The evolution of cars. Let's think about what they were designed for. They, they evolved from a primordial soup of oil and transmission fluid in a parking lot, probably in Detroit, and out crawls a Pinto. Because that is the lowest level of car, Pinto. And, and, and then and a Pacer, you know, that, 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 that kind of thing. And then, and then it becomes a Prius. A Prius is designed, you can tell the intent of the design of the Prius is to save money and have a a smaller carbon footprint because you are behind the Prius on the interstate saying, why can't you go faster? (laughs) Eventually cars evolved to the place they stood upright and they evolved uh, to a place, Escalade. The reason that an Escalade is, see, the reason a Pinto exists is to bring humility to teenagers who have to drive them. Prius is designed to save gas, obviously. And the Escalade is designed so that you could enjoy a day of your life, you know? I had a friend of mine had one, let me borrow one for a summer trip. It ruined me for any other car. And when I have $85,000 free dollars, I'm going to get me one of those, you know? (laughs) You ever look at the stuff that people are driving, you're like, how in the world do you do that? I'd have to live in that thing, you know? And I'm open to that thought. You could tell by the way that it is designed, is my point. It's intentions. And you have been designed, created, and made by Almighty God. That's why you're at church today, because there's a longing. Even if you don't know who Jesus is, even if you just came because of a friend, God's working in your life. And the deepest part of who you are will only be satisfied when you know whose you are. The deepest part of your heart and soul and life and meaning is only found in God because he's the one that made you. So this is why you enjoy being together and worshiping him. It's why we enjoy giving offerings to him. It's why we enjoy serving at the healing center. Why is all this true? Because we were designed by almighty God and I'm only satisfied in him. Anything in your life right now that's preventing you from knowing him, you want to push that aside and you want to take a step towards him. You want to hear his voice. You want to read his word every day. You desire to worship him. Where is all of this desire coming from? Because you were made. You were created by him, and you'll only find your deepest satisfaction in knowing him and bringing him glory, that everything in my life is from him, and then it'll come through me and go back up to him into worship. And that's what we want more than anything else. Who knows, maybe if, kind of, sort of, You were made. And then he says, for such a time as this. This is so great. The reason we love this phrase is because we struggle mightily with this in our own life. Are you one who is always looking ahead, looking for something else? Not satisfied with where you are, but looking. Do you know if you're always looking for the next thing, you can't be where you are right now? God wants you to be where you are right now. I found something that's very helpful that's so simple it might be overlooked, but I've adopted this in in my own life as I live for God. Now, Now, let's say you've given all of your life to him. Then what you need to start saying is, Lord, I thank you that I'm in the right place. I'm in the right time for the right reason with the right people right now. I'm in the right place, the right time, with the right people right now. And, and, and Lord, if, since you own me, if you want to change that, I'll allow you to move in my life and do that. But for me right now, I'm going I'm to just get planted right where I am 
right here, right now. I'm going to thank you. Lord, I thank you for the family that I'm in. Do you know the family that you're in? God's placed you in that for such a time as this so that you'd be a light for him. You know those crazy people you work with, that job you might want to get out of? Have you thought maybe the Lord has given you that job and he's put you around those people for this time? How many of you are not from Cincinnati? That's, that's quite a few. You know God brought you to Cincinnati for such a time as this? And what you need to do, Dad, if you've transitioned, what you need to do, Mom, husband, wife, is you need to just settle that in your heart right now. Just settle it in your heart before God. Because for some of you, it ain't Texas anymore. <laughs> right? It's Cincinnati. It's Cincinnati, which means spring will be here in a few weeks. It's Cincinnati. God you have me here. You have my family here. See, you need to just embrace that. Don't be looking for the next thing because then if you're always looking for the next thing, you can't do the thing that God has right in front of you right now for such a time as this. Did you know God has our church in Cincinnati by his anointing, his design, and his plan? It's not by chance that we have the healing center. It's not by chance that we're located right here where we're at for such a time as this. Do you know God has you in this church for such a time as this? Your level of expectation needs to rise up and your level of sense of, of God, you have me planted in this church. This is my church family. It needs to grow in you. You need to say, yes, Father, this is the family that you've planted me in, even though it is at times imperfect. Lord, I know that you've planted me here for such a time as this. You solve that, you resolve that rather in your heart before Almighty God for such a time as this. Then the story goes on. Uh, he, he's going to say, uh, you need to go to the king and you need to tell the king that all these people are going to die. And Esther is struggling with it. Esther chapter 5, verse 4. And Esther replied uh, to the king. She does get to the king. And, and with favor, he doesn't kill her. But she comes before him. If it pleases the king, let the king and, and Haman come today to a banquet I've prepared for the king. And they go to the banquet. And then Esther replied, this is my request and deepest wish. If I found favor with the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my request and do what I ask. Now, right here, she's supposed to ask uh, for the basically the life of Haman. But instead she says, uh, please come with Haman tomorrow to another banquet. I will prepare for you. So she's already at a banquet she asked for, and now she's not able to muster the strength. Then I will explain what this is all about. What happens right here is that Esther, who... Uh, has incredible trust in God, the hero of the story, but at this moment when she was supposed to do uh, what, uh, what Mordecai had told her, she stops and she doesn't do it. Have you ever been in a situation where you knew what to do and you got about halfway there and then you said, I can't do it? And then you think, God, he, he, can't, he can't minister, he can't do what he's going to do because I didn't do what I was going to do. She really was supposed to ask at that moment, but instead, what, they're at a banquet, what's your request? And she said, my request is can we do another banquet? <laughs> That's not the request. It looks like she failed. Now she failed. Now God's whole design and his whole plan, you can't thwart the plans of God with your human inability. Even in your mistakes, God can still work. When there's a delay, don't worry. God is still up to something. As a matter of fact, he uses this delay in a divine way. Now Haman was excited that he was with the king and with the queen, and then he left there, Esther 5.13, and then he added, but this is all worth nothing as long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting there in the palace gate. So he goes home and gets on Facebook, and Haman's wife, Zeresh, and all of his friends suggested something. Be careful if your friends only tell you what you want to hear. Get some new friends. Amen. They said, you know what? Set up a sharpened pole that stands 75 feet tall and... In the morning, just ask the king to impale Mordecai on it. These are some great friends. And when this is done, you can go on your merry way to the banquet with the king. And this pleased Haman. And he ordered the pole set up. He said, tomorrow's going to be a banner day. I'm going to kill my enemy in the morning, go to lunch with the king. It's going to be great. It's Friday. <laughs> that night, the king had trouble sleeping. The story, well, this, took so, this takes a weird turn. I almost said this took a weird turn. I did say that. This takes a weird turn. Why did he have trouble sleeping? Because God is working. So he ordered an attendant to bring the book of history to help him sleep. All the students said, amen. 
Why did he do that? Because God is working. And uh, this was a history of his reign so it could be read to him. And when he read it, he read about Mordecai saving his life. And he wondered, what's been done for Mordecai? They said, nothing's been done for Mordecai. That next morning he comes in and he says, uh, is anybody out in the, I just need some opinions here. I, I want to honor Mordecai. Is there anybody out there? They're like, oh yeah, this morning Haman came in bright and early, man. He's excited about something, going to have a great day. He said, let Haman come in there. So Esther chapter 6, so Haman came in and the king said, uh, what should I do to honor a man who truly pleases me? And Haman thought to himself, well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> this arrogant so-and-so. Whom would the king wish to honor more than moi? So he replied, and he's going to think up something good, you know. If the king wishes to honor someone, let's see. He should bring out one of the king's own royal robes because pride and Satan always want to take the king's place. As well as a horse that the king himself, and not just any horse, the king himself has ridden this horse. One with one of those royal emblems on his head. Make it, make it a big deal. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. And let him see that the man whom the king wishes to honor is dressed in the king's robes. And led through the city square on the king's horse. And then wait, wait, wait. I got another one. Have the official shout as they go. This is what the king does for someone he wishes to honor. I mean, all through the town. This is going to be great. Oh, excellent, the king said to Haman. Now, quick, uh, take the robes and the horse and do just as you said to, to Mordecai. Do you know Mordecai? He's that Jew who sits out by the gate. Have you seen him before? <laughs> Have you heard of him? And now don't leave out anything you suggested. You had great suggestions. You're having a good day today. Your suggestions were great. You're really on it. He goes home. Uh, Mordecai goes back to work because he never wanted to be honored in the first place. But if God wants you honored, he'll honor you. You put your trust in the Lord, and he will honor you in due time. He will honor you. Now, Haman wanted to be honored, and he was not. And then he went away with his head covered, like totally disgusted, went back to his house and Got back on Facebook. Then he ended up back. Uh, of course, we're going to have this now where we have the banquet where Queen Esther is going to ask the question, going to make the comment. So Queen Esther replied at the banquet. Now Haman's there. The king is there. If I found favor with the king and if it pleases the king, king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people will be spared. For my people and I have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. Now, if we had merely been sold as slaves, I could remain quiet, for that would be too trivial a matter to warrant disturbing the king. Look at the respect she has, even for a Persian king. Who would do such a thing, King Xerxes demanded. Who would be so presumptuous as to touch you? And Esther replied, that guy. <laughs> He's like, this day is not good, not good. This wicked Haman is your adversary and our enemy. And Haman grew pale. He grew pale. It's going to get worse. It's going to be impaled in a minute. Haman grew pale, sorry, with fright before the king and queen. Then the king jumped to his feet in a rage and went out into the palace garden. He was so angry. And Haman, however, stayed behind to plead uh, for his life with Queen Esther, for he knew that the king was intended to kill him. In despair, he fell on the couch, uh-oh, where Queen Esther was reclining. How does this look? Just as the king, God worked this out perfect. Just as the king was returning, he was seeing Haman fall on the queen. And the king exclaimed, will he even assault the queen right here in the palace before my very eyes? And as soon as the king spoke, his attendants covered Haman's face, signaling his doom. So they impaled Haman on the pole that he had set up for Mordecai. And the king's anger subsided. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Isn't that great? Oh, you should rejoice when the enemy of Almighty God is destroyed by the work of his own might and power. We are involved in his story, but it's his sovereignty and it's his providence and it's his ability behind the scenes to orchestrate things when your life is fully given to him. I want to remind you that what the enemy intends for evil in your life, God will work it for the good. If you're committed to him, he will work it for the good. 
every evil thing that, that the enemy has intended for you will be thwarted by Almighty God. And there will be a spiritual jujitsu move that God will put on it. When, the, why, when Jesus was being nailed to the cross, the enemy thought he had won. When they sealed the tomb, it sealed his doom. He thought he, that sounded good because it's true. Because it's true. And in your own life, Whatever you're going through, you just commit all of your life to him. Even if you suffer a nervous breakdown, God will say, that's okay. That's not going to overcome the plans that I have for you. The plans that God has for you are good plans for a future and a hope. And he knows how to work them out. Our job isn't to figure out everything that he's doing. Our job is to humbly obey him and give our whole life to him. Who knows if perhaps... Who knows if perhaps while I'm speaking even right now, while we're praying in just a moment, the Holy Spirit doesn't come upon you and heal everything you're going through. Who knows if perhaps this week the Lord doesn't just speak to you and give you all the wisdom that you need to walk through that situation. Who knows if perhaps God doesn't just go and touch your son or your daughter who are away from God this week and he just brings them back miraculously to himself. Who knows if perhaps he doesn't heal that marriage this week. Who knows if perhaps he just doesn't give you a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, a word of understanding. Who knows if perhaps God doesn't just come into your life and do something miraculous. He is God and he can do that. Are you open to that? Amen. Who knows? Who knows? Aren't you glad you don't have to figure everything out that's on God's level? We have a hard enough time doing what's on our level. Uh, and he's doing what he wants to do in our life. Will you stand with me? Here's how we're going to pray very intentionally as we close. Prayer and communion available up front after the service. But listen, before you go, As I was thinking of you this week and I was praying for you, I thought, you know what? I want to pray a very specific prayer, and it's a brief prayer, and you're going to repeat after me this prayer. But I wanted you to be able to, to put into words a desire that I know you already have, which is to look, I want to give you everything, and I want you to speak to me. I, I, I need to hear from the Lord on this matter. Uh, we, we need him. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to say a prayer, and, um, and you'll just repeat after me. And we're just going to invite that this week, as we're being humans, and we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and there's this humanity and divinity thing happening, that God will just talk to us, and he'll reveal things to us. So would you bow your heads with me? And if you're open to it, would you pray this with me? Dear Father God, I invite you into every area of my life. Holy Spirit of God, I welcome you. I want to seek you more. I need to hear your voice. Whatever you're doing in my life, I say yes to you. I give my heart to you. Even when I don't see it, you are working in my life. You are working your good plan in my life right now. So Father, I just thank you today for your people. I thank you for the work that you're doing in our life. And Father, I just pr uh, pray a blessing over your people today that they would go with an awareness of your Holy Spirit, that they would walk closely to you, hear your voice, experience the joy and pleasure and peace of serving you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.